Welcome to Radio Free Sunroot. You're listening to the interview podcast, Voices for Nature and Peace, where we discuss issues of ecology, empire, justice, and consciousness. We feature a variety of guests who are aware of the challenges of our time and who are working to address them. Here's your host, Calibri Ter Sonnenblum. Episode 19, Interview with a Tree Sitter, featuring Lupine. When I first moved to Portland, Oregon in the spring of 2001, I happened to end up living across the street from the Cascadia Forest Alliance, CFA. CFA was involved in direct action protests to stop logging in the Pacific Northwest, including tree sits. I covered their efforts as an indie media reporter and got to spend lots of time with them in the forest, learning about ecology and resistance. So I was thrilled to have this chance, in the second week of June 2020, to interview Lupine, a tree sitter who is currently participating in a redwood forest defense campaign to stop logging at a site in Humboldt County, California. We spoke on the phone, and though we were disconnected several times by a weak signal, we were able to have a great conversation. Tree sitters have always been heroes to me, and I really appreciated the chance to connect with someone from the newest generation to be out there fighting the good fight. So where did I reach you? Are you up in the tree today? Yeah. What's the view like from up there? The tree that I'm in is kind of in the middle of the grove of trees that are still standing. So it's nice. There's like redwoods on one side and a little grove of like red alders on the other side. Um, And then the clear cut is just like a little bit down the hill. It's maybe like 50 or 60 feet down the hill from me. So I can see it down there too. And I can see the ocean from here. And if I climb to the top of the tree, like, like I can see um, pretty far south. I think I'm seeing Arcata Bay and stuff. Wow, that's a beautiful view. Yeah, totally. I mean, except for the clear cut. Totally, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the clear cut's a trip. It makes like, it means we have really good sunsets here because there's like really open view, but it also amplifies the freeway noise and it itself is kind of, is really horrible to, to witness. So um, you've had the tree set up since about April 1st, I believe? Yeah, that's right. It's It's not a joke. Um, so it's been 70 days today. Right. And that was when Green Diamond, I think is the local company, came in and started to log? Yeah, they um, they started logging out here in March and we discovered it right at the end of March and we, we set this up in response. And Green Diamond does own a lot of land in this area, but they are a massive corporation and they own, as as you might be aware, you, um, you spend time in Oregon, they own... Uh, many, many acres of land in Oregon and Washington as well. Right. Yeah, I've spent um, quite a bit of time in uh, Humboldt and Mendocino counties, too, over the last five years uh, working on the farms there. So I'm, I'm kind of familiar with the, the area, but I hadn't actually heard of Green Diamond before. So that's private land that you're on? Yeah, that's right. These are private timberlands. And um, Green Diamond owns hundreds of acres in Humboldt County, a lot of it um, in northern Humboldt County. Where I am right now um, is about 20 miles north of the kind of metropolitan complex of Arcata and Eureka. Um, and I can hear the highway. I'm really close to the 101 and to the Pacific Coast. Um, and this land, the this is this is an indigenous village site um, called Shurai. And um, the closest town, the closest settler town is is now known as Trinidad. Right. Yeah, I've been through Trinidad. I've been up and, and down the 101 quite a few times. What kind of forest is it around there? It's a it's a really beautiful mixed forest. A lot of it has has been logged before. North of us, there's the protected Redwood National Park, but the area, the timberlands that we are here on are is all um, second and third growth. And it's Redwood dominant, but um, it's a mixed forest. So there's Ditka spruce, there's Douglas fir, red alder, um, and regionally endemic um, prickle cone pines out here. Bristle cone pines? Um, prickle cone pines, also known as bishop pine. Oh, okay. I actually haven't heard of that tree. 
Um, they they only grow in a few isolated locations in this area, and it just so happens that the timber harvest plan um, that we are attempting to defend here is uh, is one spot. The, the the company's trying to log some of the prickle cone pines right here. Right, and so what kind of um, what kind of animals and stuff live around there? Well, we've been seeing this beautiful black bear around near the sit. Um, and one of my friends just saw a uh, Humboldt Martin, a threatened species, pretty close to here. Um, there, I think there are other um, endangered and threatened species that that call this ecosystem home, but this area is is somewhat damaged now. Um, there's a a couple of flying squirrels that have moved into the trees because they like our food, and um, we get a lot of visits from hummingbirds. And I personally am am just starting to learn about the ecology of this area. Um, so it's cool to experience the wildlife that live here personally. Hummingbirds up pretty high like that, huh? Yeah. How high, how high up is your sit? Um, the, the sit that I'm living in right now is pretty low to the ground. It's probably only about 40 feet up. Uh -huh. Um, and some of the others are a little bit higher, like 60 or 70 feet. Right. Okay. So there's more than one. Yeah, we have, there's a little um, tree village here with uh, about five trees um, tied together and three of them with living set up in them. Right. And so I think some people maybe wonder why it is that tree, tree sits are effective. Uh, and that's mostly because it's a safety issue to try to cut trees around tree sits so could you talk about that a little bit and like that's why they're they're tied together too right yeah that's right it's kind of a bizarre tactic and it's the issue is that it's hard for people to it's hard for the general public to really connect with and to um i feel like to value forests that they can't see and don't have any human don't have any interaction with and so we put ourselves in the trees to try to draw attention to these places and to um, force the logging companies to stop. And it's basically our, our own safety is the thing that we're putting on the line. And so um, I feel like it's it's direct action in that we're occupying trees that were about to be cut. They were logging in this area. And when we came out, we saw a chainsaw on the ground and we were like, well, the tree right next to it, we we're like, we'll, we'll climb that one first. Um, so we actively stopped work by occupying the trees. But then more broadly than that, it's a symbolic action where our presence here hopefully draws attention to um, issues surrounding deforestation in this area and more broadly than that and um, forces forces the company to consider these things. Right. And as you, as you know, this is a tactic people have been using for a long time. So there's been many instances of people sitting in trees and you can't live in a tree forever and eventually you have to come down and the trees are cut and in other instances folks have been able to permanently save areas by waiting out the logging companies until there can be land acquisition um but i hope that the uh, awareness raising aspect of it the more symbolic aspect of it is is valuable whether or not you can save an individual area right So I think, you know, obviously a lot of people have not been into tree sits themselves. Could you tell us just a little bit about uh, what that's like to live up in a tree on a little platform, like how big it is and stuff? Yeah, the platform I'm, I live on is about three by five feet. And then we have a hammock to sleep in. And this time of year, it's pretty nice up here. Um, I'm grateful that we've had some, some late um, spring rains, but mostly it's been dry and warm. And... Um, because we're pretty close to town, um, it's easy to get supplies out here. Um, mostly it's just a privilege to get to live in the canopy and to witness the little worlds um, up here that um, humans don't normally get to see. Right, because you're living at the same level as the flying squirrels. That's right, yeah. <laughs> and we use we use a mix of like rock climbing and arborist gear. Um to enter the trees and to keep ourselves safe while we're climbing around. Um, and so you have to kind of be on the ball all the time when you're living in a tree because you're always thinking about 
how to keep yourself safe and how to not drop all your stuff. And then how is the, um, how's the platform actually attached into the tree itself? Platforms attached with several pieces of rope to an anchor point on the trunk that's made out of webbing. I don't know if that, if that makes any sense. Like, so you, so you like, you wrap the, uh, you wrap the trunk in something, right? And then attach to that. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, we wrap the trunk in, in tubular webbing in like a uh, life safe climb rated tubular webbing and then use multiple thousand pound rated uh, steel links to attach ropes that go down to the edges of the platform. And then you're spending a few days or a couple weeks up there at a time and then swap out with other people or? Yeah, I'm grateful we have a, a crew of folks and we trade out. And because all of this has transpired since the shelter in place order hit Humboldt County in the midst of the COVID pandemic. We have separate tree sits and a pretty constant stream of lovely folks has been coming through, um, visiting from out of town and staying in um, the quarantine tree we've been calling it. So uh -huh. we have we're, people are social distancing here while living in the canopy. Um, and because there's enough of us, we're able to go take a shower and get some food and um, come and go, which is a privilege. Right. So, so far, you've been able to, to come and go. They haven't tried to, like, lock the area down and starve you out or anything like that. Yeah, I'm really I'm grateful for that. Um, and Green Diamond has been making appearances. They actually came here just this morning, um, a couple hours before you called. Um, I'm pretty sure it was a Green Diamond employee. Um, it was this this guy showed up and this has been this happened a couple times now this guy showed up and kind of walked around the base of the tree he refused to look at me or engage with me i kept trying to ask him questions say hey do you work for green diamond you know uh how's your day going um i was trying to be conversational he didn't want to engage um he seemed to just be walking around the ground looking for just seeing if there were folks on the ground or stuff on the ground and um and i'm pretty sure he left but i'm not sure if he's still like hiding down there Right, right. So that was the second time. They came out about a month ago and were harassing some folks who were on the ground. But for the most part, they left us alone, and I'm really grateful for that. Yeah, yeah. And I understand that they stopped cutting as soon as you showed up, too, pretty much. Yeah, we emailed Green Diamond immediately and said, hey, there's folks in the canopy. Um, don't you, you need to stop um, working in this area. And the next morning, the Sawyers came out, and they collected their tools and left. And Green Diamond had, has been quoted in the newspaper as saying that they aren't going to call the cops on us during COVID. So right now it feels relatively safe out here. And it sounds like you've also been having a lot of good community support there too. Yeah, it feels like, um, as you know, because you've spent a lot of time in this area, there's a lot of folks, even though Humboldt's historically the economy here has been based on logging and there's a lot of good old boys. Um, there are a lot of people who I, th I think are sympathetic with forest defenders and who are concerned about the environmental impacts of logging. And so it feels like we have like broad community support here. And I feel that I feel that we're in coalition with other grassroots groups in humble, both environmental groups and groups fighting for um, necessary social justice. Is there a, like a, a legal aspect of this going on too, like with the courts or something like that? Or is it the SIT and then other organizations like just pressuring Green Diamond? There are organizations in this area that are, are doing kind of long-term work to challenge logging in the area. And the main organization that comes to mind is the Environmental Protection Information Center based out of Arcata, which work through legal realms to, to challenge logging and other industrial environmental degradation and we aren't affiliated with epic i really respect their work um and i feel like informed by it but i don't know if they are specifically working on anything related to green diamond at this moment i think it's really challenging for organizations to challenge private timber companies it feels difficult to hold them accountable there's a a whole roster of state and federal agencies that are tasked with overseeing logging on private timberlands but i feel like they're failing to do their jobs and there's not a lot of recourse for the public. That said, there was a, a boatload of public comments opposing this timber harvest plan when it was approved as well 
as the former timber harvest plan for this same area. Yeah, so who was it that approved the harvest plan? The lead agency in that process is CAL FIRE. Um, and then the other agencies that have to also review the timber harvest plan or THP are, to my knowledge, the California Water Quality Control Board, the State Department of, of Fish and Wildlife, and the Federal Fish and Wildlife Service. So what's interesting about this land in particular is that it's not just approved by all these state agencies like any timber harvest plan must be, but it's also certified. Green, all of Green Diamonds, California um, timberlands are certified by both the Sustainable Forestry Initiative and the Forest Stewardship Council. Um, quotes, and both of these are, are greenwashed third parties that allow timber companies to label their products as sustainable and to sell them at a higher price. And um, the question of what sustainable forestry looks like is complex, but I don't think that FI or FSC are an adequate solution to holding these private companies accountable. Um, and I, we see that right right below me, there's this, this clear cut. It's at least 10 acres. If we weren't here, it would be 20 acres. That's what the company intended to cut here. And 20 acres is the maximum they're allowed to clear cut under their certifications. And so that's what almost every clear cut is 20 acres. And I, I don't think any clear cut should be called sustainable. And I think we should be in a, more, in a broader sense, I think we should be questioning the very existence of industrial timber harvesting of industrial forestry during a climate crisis. If that's really how we want to be managing carbon sinks right now. Right. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about that more because uh, a lot of people talk about the importance of planting trees to sequester carbon. But of course, there's already a lot of trees there doing a great job at that. And they don't do a good job at that until they're mature. So obviously, keeping forests is, is a very important. So should we even be cutting mature trees down at a time when we're in the middle of a climate crisis? Yeah, I've been thinking about this a lot. And I think that even though I'm, I'm outraged at the way that the, that our government has handled the pandemic, I think that we are all using the language of essential to evaluate different aspects of our lives is, is kind of a fascinating um, like tool and, the logging industry is considered part of the agricultural industry and therefore it's considered essential. And so um, when the pandemic hit, um, I just I just called Green Diamond and I called Humboldt Redwood Company, which is the other major logging company in this area. And I said, are you going to keep working? And they said, yep, full steam ahead. We're essential businesses. And I think that there's so many layered, complex issues at play here. And my my brain kind of starts to like fuzz out when I think about all the things that are going on right now. But I think that the way that the pandemic has totally shut down our society might be in some ways uh, provide tools that we can use that might provide an urgency that we could use to apply ourselves to addressing the climate catastrophe that's in front of us, which I think demands an even broader like shutdown of business as usual, but a totally different one and one that's informed by climate justice and by caring for the most marginalized people instead of disregarding their safety the way that the government has during the COVID pandemic. And I think it feels really connected to me that we are in the middle of this pandemic that attacks folks' respiratory systems um, and that black and brown communities are the hardest hit by that because of lack of access to resources and systemic racism. And then at the same time, climate crisis is this much greater threat that threatens all life on earth, which is also disproportionately affecting people of color and folks in the global South and folks living in poverty. And then at the same time, there's still logging companies and other corporations that are hell bent on destroying the wildlands around us. And that feels like an existential threat, and it all feels timely in the midst of this national uprising in response to police brutality. And I hope it isn't too hippy dippy for me to say that all this feels really connected to our breath and to that like life force. It's bizarre to be like disconnected from what's happening all over the country right now, and to have comrades in the streets and people being brutalized by the police, and to meanwhile just be in this peaceful forest out here but it does feel like all part of one struggle to me. 
definitely it is part of one big struggle. I, I think I agree with you on that. And it's peaceful where you are now. But as we know from the history of tree sits and from the history of environmental resistance, that is not always the case. Indeed. And it seems like so far, Green Diamond has not been interested in trying to remove y'all from the property, but that could change when things open up again, I guess. It's true. It could change. We don't want to get too comfortable here. And Green Diamond, their parent company is called Simpson Industries. And and I think it's about 10 years since they rebranded themselves as Green Diamond, which is a greenwash move that I think some other logging companies also did around that time. But anyways, so my understanding is that the current iteration of Green Diamond's management hasn't been particularly aggressive towards tree sitters and forest defenders in general. But just last summer, Humboldt Redwood Company, who own a lot of land just down the coast from here was responding with, in my opinion, excessive force towards forest defenders who were just like we are. They were using nonviolent direct action tactics like tree sits and road blockades and were met with security guards armed with tasers and dogs and drones. And that's just what's happened, what happened last summer out there or the last couple summers in Humboldt County. But as as you know, and I'm just starting to learn about, there's this long, a long history of forest defense on the North Coast, and a lot of activists have experienced repression from the government and brutality at the hands of cops and loggers. Yeah, definitely. So how was it that you got brought to the forest? I grew up in California and ended up in Humboldt County kind of by chance and met forest defenders working here. And so it was kind of by chance that I got involved in this project in particular. But I think like a lot of people in my generation, I've been gravely concerned about the climate catastrophe since I was a teenager and um, struggling to find meaningful ways to address it. So that feels like a driving force for me, for my involvement. And it feels like a privilege to be part of a younger generation of activists who are continuing work that's been going on for um, decades here on the North Coast and to begin to learn about the movement history here um, and to learn from movement elders who are still really active. So you've met some of those elders. Yeah, it's um, it's been a privilege to get to meet and feel supported by folks who were around during the headwater struggle and who worked on countless other campaigns that received less publicity and to learn from them. And I'm really grateful that within, I, I would probably consider myself an earth firster, um, even though earth first is a decentralized movement. And so we're not like, I'm not part of any uh, an official organization, but um, it's, yeah, it feels like a privilege to be part of the fabric of the earth first movement and maybe to even be part of, of morphing it. And earth first has a lot of, ugly, racist, hetero, patriarchal roots. And it's cool at the moment to be working on a campaign that is led by young, queer, and femme people. And have a lot of the people who have come through here have been femmes, queers, and people of color. And it feels important to me to, at, like as a, as a younger activist within this movement, to continue to apply ourselves personally and, as, and broader in the movement to concepts of decolonization to anti-racist work, especially because Earth First and the envir environmental movement as a whole has a lot of entrenched racism that people have been, have been working to unpack for years, but that we still have a lot of, a lot of work to do. In a state of shock after the war, we interrupt our program for a brief message. If you appreciate this podcast, please consider supporting Colibri on Patreon. Just go to patreon.com slash Colibri. That's K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. -L -L and now, back to our regularly scheduled... So, decolonization. I'm glad to hear you mention that because that is something that wasn't mentioned so much, say, 20 years ago. Can you tell me... Uh, what decolonization means to you? Yeah, to be honest, as I'm as a as a white person, a settler in this country, I feel like I am just 
starting to learn about decolonization. I feel uh, underqualified to speak about it. But it feels like right now the climate movement in this country is really in I mean, in in so-called North America, I should say, is really indigenous led. And just this year, witnessing things, the strength and resilience of First Nations people in Canada, the Wet'suwet'en and their allies fighting back against fossil fuel infrastructure has been really humbling and really inspiring. And it's really fascinating to me to live on the North Coast and so-called Humboldt, where there's a lot of powerful, like indigenous resistance here. And just last year, kind of a coalition led by indigenous Wiyot folks was able to defeat a greenwashed wind energy development that was slated to be built south of, of the tree sits here. So I I guess I guess that doesn't really address your question of what decolonization means. But for me, as someone just starting to learn about it, trying to look toward and learn from indigenous activist leaders feels like the first step in educating myself. Yeah, I'm, I, I don't know what, yeah, I'm, I'm still trying to figure that out, but I appreciate you asking about it. Oh, yeah, I'm still trying to figure that out too. I, I, I spent some time studying a little bit of the history of that area when I was around there and I found out about the terrible massacre that happened on the island in Humboldt yeah. Bay there. You've probably heard about that, you know? Yeah. And that was a rather, you know, brutal thing. And, and to me, I, I feel like there's, there's a mark of malice that can still be felt on the land there from the history. Yeah. Yeah. I, I feel that too. And there's absolutely still relics of the not, um, not too distant past when, when indigenous people here were massacred and were enslaved and bought and sold. And a grassroots coalition was just able to get the statue of President McKinley torn down in Arcata, which had been like a long time coming. <laughs> and, but that's just one symbol of colonization that and those symbols are everywhere. And here, the, the where we're sitting is Yurok territory and is within the Shirai village. And there are descendants of the Shirai village who still live here, st are still active in, their, in this community, are still working to preserve their heritage. And we're grateful to get to spend this time in, in their land. So I, I think that making these, these connections between the environment and justice and all that, that's something that really impresses me about the younger activists who are coming up. I think that that wasn't present in the older movements that were there before. For you, are you inspired by, or are you learning about these things like from particular people or from particular books, or is it just something that the, that the movement itself is sort of pushing all the time? Um, I think it's a mix. I, t to be honest, like just over the past couple of weeks, I have been looking at socially, social media constantly to try to stay abreast of this like massive um, rebellion that's spread since George Floyd was murdered. I have been reading as much as I can. And lately I've, I've been reading this copy of the Earth First Journal from the year 2000 and admiring the work of folks who were in the movement at that time and who are still part of the movement, um, like reading an article by Karen Coulter, who is now working on the Blue Mountains Biodiversity Projects, fighting fighting for forests in eastern Oregon, and, and reading her writing about trying to convince Earth First to adopt an anti-imperialist platform in the year, 20 years ago now. Um, and I think my, my generation is has the tools and language to talk about intersectionality and to connect all of these issues. But I realize that, that there's folks in our movement have, have been having these discussions for some time now, and it's a, it's a slow process, but I'm grateful for the work that they've been doing. Karen Coulter is really a special person. I had the honor of meeting her back in 2000, I want to say three or so, uh, out on her land in Eastern Oregon there. And she's actually on my list of uh, people I want to interview for this podcast, cool. actually. <laughs> cool. <laughs> yeah, so now I've got another question I need to ask her about that, about how that went in, in 2000, because I hadn't heard about that. So it's interesting because of the technology that we have, you're able to be isolated and yet connected at the same time. 
yeah, it's totally bizarre to be in a tree with a smartphone, you know, and then I have Green Diamond come and be walking around below me and I put a video of it on Instagram and people who live in other parts of the country send me emojis about it. It's t- a totally bizarre experience to be out in this, you know, a place I would like to think of as kind of like wilderness place. Um, no, uh, that concept is, is problematic. But dare I say a wilderness area and then be at the same time really connected to people all over the place and to feel like really part of like, I, it's really, I, I'm grateful for that because it makes me feel like I'm part of, like, I'm not just, it's not just me and a couple of my friends sitting in a tree. It's like, we're part of a massive climate movement. You uh, said that you were a little skeptical of the term wilderness. Can you tell me a little more about that? Um, yeah, and an, an indigenous friend of mine has given me a bunch of readings that I've been just slowly exploring, discussing kind of problematic aspects of the environmental movement. And one of those things that's come up is the concept of wilderness. So I'm just starting to read about that and learn that that concept was invented by settlers and it feels to me to be really connected to our othering of of ourselves as settlers, our othering of ourselves from the land and disconnection from the land and that concept has been um a tool that is has been used to excuse the genocide of indigenous people and here in california i'm just starting to learn about the history of land management here is that a lot of indigenous people lived here and they modified the landscape in profound ways and a lot of the landscape we see around us is different than it might have been otherwise because of indigenous people who lived here for generations and harvested and burned and planted and sowed here and cared for this land as it cared for them. And so settlers came and were like, oh, this vast wilderness. And um, that was that is intimately tied to to genocide of native peoples. And now we have these land management conundrums where the forests are overgrown and the timber industry says, oh, well, we have to log these forests, you know, to keep them to keep them from becoming overcrowded. But what's actually happening is that we've been suppressing fires for generations and there's been no traditional indigenous burning like there once was. And the forests are overgrown from fire suppression and from logging where when you cut, it regrows a lot denser. So all this stuff feels really connected in my mind. Right. So you have the contrast between the indigenous land management that happened before that one could describe perhaps as cooperative, and then the settler land management practices that could really be described more as dominating, perhaps. Yeah, dominating and, dare I say, extractive. Yeah, I think, I mean, settlers haven't been here in California for very long, and we are obviously struggling to figure out how to care for the landscape. We're totally failing. And indigenous people spent generations developing complex knowledge about this land. Right. So within the context of all of that, have you have you been there long enough up in that tree in that particular spot to start to have some ideas or some feelings about what should be happening there? I would love to see the timber companies fund broad scale, non-commercial thinning of these forests and prescribe burns and stop industrial commercial timber harvest management and i'm i've been inspired by groups like the group moms for housing in oakland and the group reclaiming homes um los angeles have reminded us that in california where we often talk about the housing crisis the housing crisis the crisis is not a lack of a lack of actual homes for people to live in it's a lack of access for those who need it and maybe i can't speak for a, a to a global need for housing but perhaps maybe in these dense coastal areas we don't actually need to be cutting down trees and building more homes, we need to be providing homes to those who need it from the houses that are standing there empty in these cities. Maybe logging isn't essential. We, we could totally reevaluate whether we still need to be deforesting the Pacific Northwest, you know? Right. Yeah. Well, it's very telling that logging is considered, quote, agricultural, you know? I mean, yeah. Thanks for saying that. <laughs> Well, yeah, because the, you know, the national forests, you know, the, the federal ones, you know, those are under the Department of Agriculture. Right. So the forests are, quote, managed as crops. And that 
is bad enough all by itself, but then it's also being done within this capitalist context for, for profit. And so what you suggested that one could, you know, in theory, go in and, and thin some trees for the health of the area. The problem there is that that doesn't make any money for anybody. Yeah. And so there's, well, there's that challenge, you know, I mean, you must right. have there's some no, ideas about no that. No timber company would, would want that. I mean, it's just, a, we're up against some real existential questions with climate catastrophe. And it's like money currently defines every aspect of our reality, but we have to realize that it's not going to save us from what we're facing. And you know this and generations of activists know this. And I don't have a practical solution to the management for the hundreds of thousands of privately owned timberlands in Humboldt County that are currently managed for profit by these the capitalist corporations. I don't, I, I know that those corporations aren't listening and aren't preparing for climate change. And I think what feels like the most heinous aspect of this to me is the greenwashing and is that the timber industry has all their scientists saying that coming through and cutting an area and then replanting it with fast growing species like redwood or Douglas fir actually sequesters more carbon because those trees can grow so fast when we know that old growth forests have the greatest carbon sequestration capacity and we know that doesn't make sense to cut down carbon sinks and um, the sustainability certifiers and the agencies that are failing to really hold the companies accountable and and all of this feels like a, a very heinous plot to trick I mean maybe this sounds conspiracy theorist but I think the companies are actively trying to trick consumers into thinking that they are part of the solution and we see this with you know, this is happening across the board where Chevron is posting Black Lives Matter and logging companies are saying, oh, we are the climate solution. And that feels incredibly heinous to me. Yeah, I don't see how it could possibly be true, personally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think that you're 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 definitely astute in noticing that. And I don't think it's conspiratorial to notice that they're doing their best to ensure their future profits. Yeah, that's the, the cold logic of capitalism. Yeah, the cold logic. That's a good way of putting it. Pretty often a story comes out about something else that the current presidential administration is doing that's terrible for the environment, you know. And mm -hmm. of course, in my memory, every president's been bad for the environment. There's never really been one who was good for the environment. You know, I mean, Clinton was terrible for the forests, for example, you know, but yeah. at the same time, it's also true that this current administration is really taking down regulations at a, at a, at a faster rate. But I feel like that the environmental sins of this administration don't get enough attention and that I don't grudge any attention that any other issues getting, but it seems like environmental issues kind of always get pushed off to the side. I don't know. Do you, do you see that too in the news or? Yeah. I mean, I, th I think in general that's true because I feel like the mainstream media is, it's obviously guilty of anthropocentrism and all of us are guilty of anthropocentrism. And it's kind of natural for us to center ourselves when we think about the world. But if we think about like how important environmental regulations are to protecting all of our health and how important they are to protecting the health of every other species on, on spaceship earth. To me, it doesn't have to, it doesn't have to be a question of whether we're like focusing on social justice issues or whether we're focusing on environmental issues because those two things are so intimately connected in my mind. So I don't, I don't feel like I, I ever am like, oh, I wish that we could talk about, you know, it doesn't, it feels like off mark to try to prioritize one, one issue or another when they're all demanding our attention, but rather to like figure out ways to, to realize how they're connected. No, I hear you. I hear you. And I think that for a lot of people, the issues that we're talking about when it comes to the environment are sort of far away or abstract, you know, like recently with all these protests around George Floyd, it feels like that's all been brought right in front of us into our faces. You know, I mean, I feel like a lot of us, mm -hmm. it's been made so real all the streaming video and all the stories and all that. And so that's been cool. And I feel like something like that hasn't happened yet that's sort of put the environment in people's faces. 
Yeah, it's almost interesting where you have to, you almost have to engage in resistance to understand what you're resisting in some ways. And I think maybe what's happening all over the country is that people, people are maybe who, who wouldn't have otherwise been, been thinking about these things or at least maybe thinking about them, but it wouldn't have been central in their lives are showing up to demonstrations and then are firsthand experiencing police brutality. And the, I feel like the way that the police are handling this is actually adding fire to the movement because they're escalating when protesters aren't escalating and they, and so all these people who might not otherwise be in the streets are now out there and they're experiencing tear gas and rubber bullets and they're seeing police violence firsthand. And I would imagine that that's like a, ra that's a radicalizing experience for a lot of people. And I feel like force defenders experience the same thing where we'll go out into an area that's slated to be cut and will you know f kind of fall in love with the forest and spend a lot of time in it and be trying to defend it and then at times we'll witness its destruction and that will even even further convince us in our minds of how Im important the work we're doing is if that makes any sense yes i've definitely um, experienced that and yeah i don't know to uh, whatever type of activism you're engaged in to go through that process and to experience repression firsthand i think for, for me personally, that process has like cemented my ideals and hasn't, I mean, not without a continual effort to, to self critique and to learn more, but also, but I mean, it totally like strengthens our commitment, I think, as activists. Right. What do you mean when you talk about, when you mentioned self critique? Um, I was just talking with my dad about this this morning and that we were, kind of mocking various figureheads in the environmental movement and my dad kind of i think was hitting the nail on the head when he was saying he, and he mentioned to me that he thinks that people start to go off mark and become irrelevant or whatever when they are failing to just constantly engage in self-critique and education and it's that feels i think i mean that should be a basic human value but especially as activists i think that it might be easy for us to hold too tightly onto the, our way of seeing things and sometimes we have to because it feels like everyone in the world is against us. But I'm curious if we can push ourselves to challenge each other and to, and to challenge ourselves and to continually be learning more ab about the work we're doing and wondering how we could improve it. And I'm excited. The group of folks that I'm working with right now, we're, we've discussed this and we're committed to, to challenging each other about our ideas and to trying to learn and grow. That sounds great. That's impressive. I don't necessarily hear activists talking about that very much that's why i was asking you it's not easy to do so it's more of an it's something that i would like to work towards than something that i'm necessarily practicing well you know <laughs> yeah i hear you so in the interest of trying to to bring the importance of what you're doing to people who haven't been in the forest before what would you say were, to help people who are like living in the city and don't come to the forest understand why why this is important to you and 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 why you love it really you know you you asked me that question and i've been thinking about it a lot and trying to think about what spending time in the forest and attempting to defend it has taught me personally and probably just a bunch of like really cliched things like i was thinking about the the hillside we're on is, is second growth redwood forest, but there's still these um, really big old growth stumps that have now become like gardens of ferns and huckleberries. And what's cool about redwoods is they make these structures called cathedrals where if one redwood dies or is cut down, often its roots will still be alive and they'll re-sprout. And so a, sometimes a circle or a cluster of trees will be growing around what was the original tree that's now gone. And to my knowledge, if that's unique in conifers, like the other conifers that grow in this area, like spruce and, and firs, um, don't, don't re-sprout in that way. So when a tree's cut down, it dies and that, or that organism is gone, you know? So I've just been thinking about this, this area in particular a lot because there's, so the old growth trees are now gone and only their stumps are left, but the organisms are still there. Their roots are still alive. And the younger trees that are sprouted up from their roots are genetically identical to those old growth trees and are literally growing from the same roots. So there it's this, it's the same tree essentially. So there are these old growth organisms that are still here and they still have all of the, the relationships in the soil, the fungal and microbial relationships that those trees built. And I feel like. There's no way to sound this without to say this without sounding like a hippie, but it's reminding me how connected everything is through time and also through space and thinking about the 
when they like when they come through and clear cut, they'll often leave a few trees here and there in the middle of the cut. And that's like what they're supposed to do so that they aren't cutting everything. But then when you look at the one tree standing in the middle of the cut with everything around it dead, you wonder like how it's going to survive in the wind and in the weather without its family around it supporting it. And if before its roots were connected to the other trees roots, if how it will do now that that those other trees roots around it are dying and it's just left there. And so just being in this forest every day, I think is reminding me how we can't remove a single piece of, you can't take one without it affecting all of them. And so I've just been thinking about that a lot and thinking about the timber company's practice of cutting things in succession. So they'll clear cut one spot and then they'll leave that to regrow for 40 years and cut another spot and witnessing firsthand how, how really damaging that is to this, this complex web and um, like how valuable those relationships are, like the relationships within the ecological community, I guess. I don't, I don't know. That's just something I've been thinking about a lot. Right. Well, I think that that's, that is something that, that is a thought you get from being out there because when you're in the city, it doesn't feel like you're in a natural environment. I mean, we still are in a natural environment when we're in the city. It's just a heavily impacted environment, but it's harder to see those relationships. And everything, of course, in the city is so incredibly fragmented as well, you know? Yeah, it's true. I, I grew up in the city and I really, I actually like being in the city. Uh, you know, a lot of Earth Firsters who don't like being in the city, but I enjoy it. And sometimes, but sometimes I'll, I'll sit in a place in my hometown where you can kind of see out over the town and I'll just visualize what it might have. I'll, I think it's just inter interesting mental, mental exercise. I would encourage people in the city to do. visualize what might this place have looked like before colonization. And, you know, maybe there was there was people living here. Of course, there the places that they lived look, looked really different and the way that they modified the landscape looked really different. And um like in my hometown, there's, there were a lot of creeks that aren't, that aren't there anymore. They're, we call them ghost creeks and they've been culverted or drained. Um, and it, I think, um, the, ex I mean, depending on where you live, the extent to which we can reintroduce native species into our gardens or spend time in like parks or little pockets of wildlands around our home it might be limited, but to at least visualize what it might have looked like and visualize the, the vast networks of ecosystem across so-called North America at the at the time of at the time of colonization is, I think it's an interesting mental exercise. And also to like, I think we talked about this before to learn about what, not to visualize that as a untouched and vast wilderness, which is in line, which is a, a kind of genocidal mindset, um, but to start to learn about. Um, the traditional ecological knowledge held by indigenous people and the ways that they modified the landscape, but over centuries were able to sustain themselves and um, care for the land and how, you know, it's been a relatively short amount of time that us settlers have been here and how drastically we've changed it in such an unsustainable way. Yeah, because we've just kind of come here and used things up, whether that's the forest that we've cut down or the topsoil that we've used and is blown away or the all the the fish that we've taken and now they're not there anymore. I mean, it's been a it's been very extractive what we've been doing and yeah, how things were done yeah. here before was was not extractive. It was more it was more of a relationship. I was just going to say I was just reading about the history of the whatever California ecology before colonization and and like the descriptions of like the rivers here so full of salmon that it looked like you could walk across and thinking about it's just the the massive amount of life that has been lost since colonization here is is almost like hard to fathom and I don't want to and to me the destruction of indigenous food sources is would feels like a part of the colonization process and a and a equally a, like a genocidal act in in many ways and it's hard to fathom. And similarly, when I think about that, we have less than 5% left of what was what was once the original, I think it was 3 million acres of old growth intact redwood forest at, at the time of colonization and thinking about this tiny percentage that's left and visiting the places that are protected, the st state and national parks, and imagining what it must have been like for there to be 3 million acres of of that ecosystem is is almost unfathomable to me, you know? 
Definitely. I have, I, I was aware of that number that it's less than 5%. And I've been to some of those old groves and it's, um, that's a good word, unfathomable. It's just unimaginable for me too to be able to, to, to what was that like? You know, I mean, we also hear stories that, you yeah. know, ships couldn't leave um, port on the West Coast at certain times of year. Uh, they'd have to wait two or three days because the migrating whales were coming through and they were so dense wow. that you couldn't get a ship through. Yeah. And just like these stories of, you know, Douglas yeah, fir beautiful. trees that are 300 feet high and like, yeah, it's, it's crazy. Yeah. I kind of went through the list of things that I was curious about. So it's just, if you have anything else you wanted to add at this point. Well, there's been just the past couple of days, this, this teenage filmmaker is visiting us. Who's making a documentary um, about environmental and climate issues. And, and in conversation with them, this, concept keeps arising of like the more we think about climate science the more it feels like really hopeless and and when we look at the current trajectory we're on it's like oh my, we just can't change things as drastically as we need to in time to avert um the worst aspects of the climate crisis and um yeah and when i think about that it's i start to wonder like does it like does it matter what we're doing or like what does a response actually look like in that context and something I've been thinking about lately and that this, this teenage filmmaker who I'm in conversation with is also talking about is, well, it, okay, we can't actually stop climate change. We can't actually save everything, but what if it, so industrial capitalism is trying to destroy ev basically everything. What if we get in the way a little bit and if we're able to keep it from destroying some areas so that as things, you know, I, I hope that the global industrial economy doesn't continue unchecked forever. And if it, if things are grinding to a halt because of because of climate as kind of the ultimate limit, limit in human activity, um, maybe we can com keep these corporations from destroying everything so that there's like a little bit of patches left that can regenerate in whatever world comes after this. So even when I feel really hopeless, that's something that I hold on to as as maybe something valuable about doing eco defense work in in these kind of end climate end times, I guess. So, yeah, I just wanted to say that. That's the only thing. So how is it that people can help you guys out or support y'all? Oh, thanks for asking that. Um, I feel like the number one way, well, because this is a podcast, so folks might be listening from all over. And the number one way is that these corporate giants that are trying to destroy this place where we're at, this tree that I'm currently sitting in and the land around this, they're wings of that corporate octopus are in your neighborhood and are trying to destroy the wildlands around you. So what I, what I ask is that folks join local grassroots direct action environmental groups um, that are working in their areas or start some if there's that need and support those groups. And if people are local in Humboldt County and want to plug in with us, we always welcome visitors out here. Um, if folks want to come and, sit in a tree we will build you a, a tree sit of your own or if you want to um just drop in and um if if folks want to follow us on social media you can um we're on instagram at redwood forest defense and i think we'll have a website up soon but it's not quite there yet and people are welcome to contact us at redwood forest defense at protonmail.com you can also Venmo us at Redwood Forest Defense if you want to support financially, though there's, I think there's a lot of uh, really badass anti-racist like bail funds and defunding police department campaigns and other things that really need support right now. And I would ask folks to prioritize that. But we're over here and we're going to be holding it down through whatever whatever happens, whether it's in a seemingly unending pandemic or a national uprising against police brutality. We're, we'll probably just still be here in these trees. The, this timber harvest plant is still, means that this area is still under threat for a few more years, so. A few more years? Yeah. Like the plan has a, a, an amount of time that it applies to, you mean, or? Yeah, when the companies file the plan with CDF, they, when it's approved, they have five years in which to cut it, and then they can file an extension for two more years, so. Um, this one was filed, I believe, at the end of 2018 and approved in 2019. Right. Okay. So you still have four and a half years or something like that to go to try to stop them from going any further there. Yeah. 
I mean, I'm just sitting in this one tree. We're just in this little tree village on this hillside, and one timber harvest plant. And this one's special because forest defenders had, had been sitting here for several years before and successfully defended it. And there's a lot of community opposition to this timber harvest plant in particular because it's an, an area where folks hike and um, close to people's homes and stuff. But this is happening all over the country on hundreds of acres that um, where Green Gaiman is just clear cutting in um, in really short rotations and just coming back to a given area after um, a few decades and cutting again. And so it's hard to contend with the massive scale of what we're up against. So what would you like to have as your final word here? It's a privilege to be in coalition with with those who are fighting each each arm of this corporate extractive octopus that is kind of threatening our very existence. <laughs> I don't know what else to say. <laughs> For my part, I'm just really encouraged by young people like yourself who are out there doing this. I think it's awesome. And thank you very much for what you're doing. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Voices for Nature and Peace is produced in the Gila River Valley, New Mexico, USA, on land that we acknowledge is illegally occupied Apache territory. The intro music is Zero G Yogi by Big Z, with narration by Kelly Moody of the Ground Shots podcast. This outro music is Trip A, also by Big Z. Commercial break narration by Nikki Hill. To become a financial supporter of this podcast and to gain access to members-only content, visit patreon.com slash colibri, K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. For more information on Radio Free Sunroot programming, please visit radiofreesunroot.com. Thank you for listening. May you find joy in your own nature and peace.